Well, good afternoon and welcome back to IDAS 300, COVID-19 in Context, offered by the University of Mary Washington. I'm Anand Rao, faculty member here at UMW, and I'm pleased to introduce today's session, Visual Arts and Plagues, Responses from Early Modern Italy, Museums, and Zen Buddhism. Now, our presenters today are all faculty in art history at UMW, and they include Dr. Julia Delancey, Dr. Marjorie Ock, and Dr. Susie Kim. Now, before I turn it over to them, I wanted to provide just a few reminders about the session. Now, we will start with the presentation, which will be about 30 minutes, and that'll be followed by a 30-minute Q&A. You can submit questions for the presenters in the Q&A box, and you'll find the button for that at the bottom of your Zoom window. And once you click on that, it'll open up. You'll be able to view other questions as well as post your own. Um, now, be sure to look over some of the other questions because you have the option of upvoting your favorite questions. And that's important because when we start the Q&A, we often have very many questions. We won't be able to get through them all, but we will start with the top rated questions. So make sure you upvote your favorite questions that are in the queue. Now, you also have a chat box that you can use to send messages to the panelists. Um, please use that to inform us of any technical concerns or send something directly to us. Any questions though, make sure you put that in the Q&A box. Now, without any further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Delancey to begin the presentation. Dr. Delancey. Thank you so much, Dr. Rao. I'm so happy to be here today with all of you and with my wonderful colleagues in art and art history, Dr. Kim and Dr. Ock, to look at visual arts and plagues. We'll be looking in particular today at responses from early modern or Renaissance Venice, from museums today, and from Zen Buddhist artists in Japan. In many ways, all three of us are looking at how visual things, their creation, their display, and their viewing can help us respond to times of great challenge. In my short time with you today, I'd like to ask a fairly fundamental question. How did people in Venice hundreds of years ago respond when faced to it with the pandemic? In their case, the bubonic plague. Of course, Italy in general and Venice in particular have been in the news a lot in relation to COVID-19. Everything from early high death rates shown in the graph in the upper right to diminishing tourism seen through the decreasing crowds in Piazza San Marco on the left and efforts to stay connected during the quarantine. For example, these two men playing musical instruments on a balcony. However, that's all for another lecture. The question for all of us this afternoon is, how might we use visual material from the past, and in particular, the urban fabric and buildings in a city, as an opportunity to understand our present moment and to respond? So first, what was the bubonic plague? Earlier in our course, the biologists helped us to understand that COVID-19 is caused by a virus. The plague, on the other hand, was caused by a bacterium whose long fuzzy form appears below here. This bacterium is passed by fleas, such as the one in the upper left, from rodents to humans. The bubonic plague is characterized by swellings, often near the lymph nodes called buboes, and it is from them that the bubonic plague gets its name. In this image, they appear on the neck of the man who has fallen to the ground. And if we look at this detail, you can just see one of the buboes here um, on his neck. What we're seeing here are two grave diggers preparing to bury this body, and one of them has fallen victim to the plague. Clergy pray on the right, and then in the sky above, St. Sebastian is asking God on behalf of the city below to free it from the plague. 500 years ago, though, people did not have an understanding of bacteria. Instead, they believed that the plague had both physical scientific causes, but also religious ones, most of which revolved around the idea that God sent the plague as a punishment for a whole host of things. So with that grounding, we might ask why the bubonic plague and why Venice? The bubonic plague or the Black Death is probably one of the most famous pandemics in history and is still by far the deadliest. And it had a global impact. This comparison of plague deaths with deaths from other pandemics shows us, us that in one outbreak from 1347 to 1351, the bubonic plague caused the death of 2 million people or 30 to 50% of the population at the time. And we'll be hearing about other plagues later in the course. 
Venice was often particularly hard hit by outbreaks of the plague. Shown in this map of Europe in the upper left, her geographic position at the top of the Adriatic meant that she was a true crossroads between cultures. Then, as now, a lot of people from a lot of places came through Venice for a lot of reasons. That fueled the spread of the plague, not only within Venice, but also abroad. The first major outbreak of the plague in Europe in the 1340s did not affect Venice as much as other Italian city-states. But during the 15th century, Venice, and really Europe as a whole, saw an outbreak of the plague roughly once per decade. After that, in the 16th and 17th centuries in Venice, the outbreaks happened less frequently, but on a larger scale. To give but one example of that large scale, in the 1630 to 31 plague, when Venice was particularly badly affected, historians calculate that about 33% of the population of Venice died in less than one year. We know that partly thanks to detailed handwritten death records, such as the one here on the left. And just for reference, that 33% rate would be roughly equivalent now to 3 million deaths in New York City. Because of those experiences with the plague, the Venetians responded regularly, powerfully, and in an innovative way. Of course, in the short time we have today, we won't be able to discuss all of their responses, so I'd like to focus on just two, and um, these are particularly notable or important ones. First, the idea of the quarantine, which was a Venetian innovation and took place before during and after outbreaks of the plague, and second, artistic creation, and today we'll be focusing on what people made after an outbreak. So how did Venetians respond to the plague? First, they responded by trying to protect their people and their goods by creating the idea of quarantine. Dr. Rao's spoken with us about the importance of words. The English term quarantine derives from the Italian word for a 40-day period, quarantina, and refers to a tactic whereby Venetians believed that they could control the spread of the plague by isolating both people and goods for a period of 40 days. The Venetians also had a structural advantage in that the islands in the lagoon provided ideal places for quarantine. This aerial view of the city marked in white shows her position in the Venetian lagoon surrounded by islands. As early as 1428, the Venetians began building on those islands plague hospitals, which became major public health institutions. They built two plague hospitals known as Lazzaretti, both of which are marked on this satellite view on their respective islands above and below the main city of Venice. The old plague hospital built in 1428 and the new plague hospital built in the 1460s. Each plague hospital had a distinct role. The old plague hospital served people actively sick with the plague and was used for quarantine and for treatment. The new hospital served people who had been exposed to the plague but weren't yet sick and people were covering from the plague. So you could be moved from the old plague hospital to the new plague hospital. It also served for the quarantining of merchants, travelers, and goods from abroad. The islands are still there, but not all of the buildings survive, and most of what does has fallen into disrepair, although there's a wonderful museum on the site of the new plague hospital. However, we can get some sense of the general function if we look at the plan in this slide. And this plan shows us the long, narrow, rectangular um, wards here on the left side of the island, the chapel here in the center, and then here a separate island where the two um, generally married couple who oversaw the hospital would live. And then these two images at the top, these two artworks as works, give us some idea of what the island looked like at least in the 18th century. It's boat landing platform here, the chapel dominating the overall layout of the island, and then various surrounding buildings. So Venetians stood at the forefront of developing public health responses to controlling outbreaks of the plague. However, what did they do when an outbreak had passed? How did they respond after? Here again, they did a variety of things, and we'll only have time to focus on one of the most visible, the building of votive churches. So we talked earlier about the Venetians' belief in both physical but also spiritual causes for the plague. 
The spiritual causes meant that they prayed and they made promises and they did that as a community. In the 1630 to 31 plague, the city prayed to Mary, mother of Jesus, to ask her to protect them. And they went further to say that if they were saved from the plague, they would build a votive church to her. And students have read the document recording that promise. True to their word, when that outbreak to the, of the plague ended, the Venetians got to building, and the result is one of the most recognizable parts of the Venetian skyline and one of the most remarkable buildings in a city of remarkable buildings, the Church of Santa Maria della Salute, or St. Mary of Health. The white marble octagonal church rises above much of the city, right next to the low customs building in the lower left here, and right across from the political and spiritual heart of the city. So here's Santa Maria della Salute in the center. Here is the political and spiritual heart of the city. The Grand Canal heads off here. And then also across this other canal sits another church dedicated to the Christ the Redeemer, excuse me, dedicated to Christ the Redeemer. And that church was also built in thanks for release from an earlier plague. In other words, these built responses to plague outbreaks were woven inextricably into the fabric of the city and placed in its very heart, reminding anyone who comes to Venice of the Venetians' experiences and their losses, but also of their release and gratitude. It emphasizes how important the display and viewing of artistic creation can be, which Dr. Ock will touch on next and expresses gratitude and a relief from the stress of living with a pandemic, something Dr. Kim will touch on with us in a few minutes. For now, thank you, and over to Dr. Ock. Thank you, Dr. Delancey, and thank you, Dr. Rao. Thank you, Dr. Delancey, for your insights on how Venice responded to the plague of 1631, and thank you to our students and guests for joining us this afternoon. I am Marjorie Ah, Professor of Art History and Museum Studies. I'm speaking to you this afternoon from the Convergence Gallery of Simpson Library, where there is currently an exhibition on Dr. James Farmer, some of which you see behind me. Here we have views of one of the most important art exhibitions, uh, art collections, excuse me, in the United States, the Nelson Atkins Museum in Kansas City, Missouri. And I hope you're asking, what are penguins doing in an art museum? According to the zoo's executive director, the penguins have missed the regular um, interactions with zoo visitors. We're always looking for ways to enrich their lives and stimulate their days. And during this shutdown period, our animals really miss visitors coming up to see them. This may seem odd. Do penguins really need to interact with visitors? Will a field trip to an art museum help them get through these difficult days? This is analogous to the role museums play in our lives. Museums stimulate our minds and allow us to look beyond ourselves to what is important in other cultures and see how people throughout history communicated to one another what it meant to be alive. This afternoon we'll consider what art installations look like in a museum what it meant to close in March, what museums have been doing since March, and what's going to change when museums reopen. Just what is a museum? Well, it's a collection of objects that individuals have deemed significant, representative, and typically best examples. These objects are often housed in buildings purposefully built for them and designed to look like ancient Greco-Roman temples. John Russell Pope was the premier architect in the United States of this classicizing style in the early 20th century. And he was commissioned to design both the Baltimore Museum of Art as well as the National Gallery of Art in DC. This classicizing style was a way to identify the objects inside as precious, one might even say sacred. And humans have long desired proximity to what is sacred. This preciousness of the objects is clearly communicated inside these temples of culture, where paintings are carefully placed on walls and sculptures on pedestals. No two works impinge on a viewer's desire to focus solely on one object and attend to it. 
We have lost this opportunity to engage directly with the object, to absorb its special properties during this pandemic. This year, the Museum of Fine Arts in Ghent, Belgium, scheduled the largest exhibition ever on Jan van Eyck, the most important art artist of Northern Europe in the early 15th century. Only about 20, uh, 20 of his works survived, and the exhibition included 14 of these, together with works by artists who were influenced by him for a total of over 100 works in 13 rooms within the museum. The Ghent Museum reopened on May 19th without the Van Eyck exhibition. This was a great loss to scholars who could have compared works by Van Eyck side by side. It was a loss to Belgians who take pride in calling Van Eyck their own. And it was a loss to the general public who may not know Van Eyck and would have chanced upon his extraordinary paintings in the museum and paused to consider the exquisite detail of his art and the complicated symbolism of his work. Here you see three details from an altarpiece that was in the exhibition. At left is a tiara worn by Jesus in the altarpiece, at the center of which is a pearl and depicted in that pearl is the reflection of the painter himself. That pearl is about one inch diameter. In the center detail, we see Van Eyck's attention to the anatomy of a horse, as well as the gem studded bridle it wears. At right is a detail of flowers and grasses. All are details that you marvel at in person. It isn't just the particular details in Van Eyck, it's the amassing of details each one holding a meaning for the 15th century viewer. Looking at works online, but we miss the personal connections that a face-to-face -face encounter with the work offers. And we certainly miss the recognition of scale. This painting is 11 and a half feet high and over 15 feet wide. The figure of Jesus enthroned at the center wearing the tiara in which Jan painted himself is life-size. Um, life and that portrait indicates to us that Jan saw himself standing before Christ. Whatever our faith, this is an extraordinary statement for a painter to make and a museum visitor to ponder. We missed this when the museum closed. Online is where museums went for the middle of March, and many museums remain online. Those with financial and technological resources develop videos about their collections for online visitors. Some videos are specifically designed to assist parents teaching children at home. Others offer diversion to people missing their museum visits. One of my favorites is the Sewn Museum in London. This tour is a sci-fi fly-through that allows an online visitor to land in galleries to explore specific objects from the collection in greater detail, such as this ancient Egyptian sarcophagus that is one of many antiquities sewn an esteemed architect of the early 19th century acquired and lived with in his London home. The National Gallery of Art has many videos, including one specifically for frontline workers whose jobs place them in the most difficult um, of environments, COVID-19 hospital wards. This particular video is a five minute meditation that involves deep breathing, close looking, and careful observation of our thoughts and feelings. It was posted at the start of National Nurses Week in early May and was designed to bring some moments of peace to healthcare workers confronting death and suffering, and suffering themselves from feelings of helplessness. Other museums are physically taking art into their communities. The Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art commissioned local artists to design postcards that the public could color and add messages to. The museum then mailed the cards to nursing home residents, a population that has been among the most vulnerable and the most isolated during the pandemic and museum programs for the public have also gone online. The National Museum of Art has long had an acclaimed on-site program for individuals with Alzheimer's. 
their Reflections program continues, but all activities are now online. What will museums look like when they reopen? What will they bring with them from pre-pandemic times? What will they leave behind? Let's look at a few examples. What art museums do best in their physical buildings is show art. For example, the Baltimore Museum of Art is home to the Cone Collection, one of the most important collections of modern art in the world. The image at left is a view into one of the galleries that holds the Cone Collection. The story of the collectors, the Cone sisters, is fascinating. And the museum has long shared this story online, highlighting photographs of the sisters and their friends. It's wonderful, for instance, to see photographs of one of their favorite painters, Matisse, in his home with works that he eventually sent to them, including Interior with Dog of 1934, which you see hanging in the gallery at left. The story of the sisters can easily be told online and additional information are just a click away. But how has that expanded story been told in the familiar and traditional museum setting? The museum has recreated part of the sisters' Baltimore apartment in the galleries, and this allows the visitor to appreciate how these two extraordinary women lived with art. But the sisters also collected jewelry, textiles, hair combs, and many other things, and the museum wants to tell that story as well. A special cabinet was built that allows visitors to open drawers to see more of what the sisters collected. It's a holistic way of sharing the, the story of this collection. That cabinet is a problem for us now, as is every interactive installation. Museums have achieved a great deal by making their collections more accessible to the public and interactive. Once the museum reopens, these interactive displays will either be closed or significantly altered to protect the public from contracting COVID-19. Some museums are even considering removing wall labels that identify works and creating an app that visitors can access to avoid the problem of people getting too close to the wall to read the label. You get the picture, reopening a museum will be um, problematic. How might be museums begin to reopen? Some are located within parks and their nature trails reopened not long ago. For example, the Glenstone in Potomac, Maryland is a private museum of contemporary art set within many acres of a forested estate. While the galleries remain closed, its extensive sculpture garden and nature trails are open several days a week. Visitors are required to have timed tickets, and these are available online Monday at 10 a.m. and are almost immediately gone. If you do get a ticket, you are required to wear a mask at all times and maintain social distancing. What will museums look like? when they fully reopen. One museum in Rome opened on June 2nd with an exhibition on Raphael, a contemporary of both Leonardo and Michelangelo. The ex exhibition has been years in the planning. Now visitors must purchase tickets in advance and the museum admits fewer than half the number it would have prior to this pandemic. And as you can see in the image of one of the galleries, there are arrows on the floor indicating the required path as well as um, markers indicating six feet of required social distancing. In other words, we won't have scenes such as these from previous openings and events at the Brooklyn Museum in New York, where exhibition spaces were busy with visitors moving wherever they pleased and lobbies were abuzz with special events such as food festivals and break dancing. One difference we will discover will be in what museums collect. People are documenting their personal experiences of COVID-19 and museums are taking notice. It remains to be seen what images from this pandemic most fully capture our understanding of this moment and how we choose to share it with the future. There will be much to choose from, including children's journals, as well as photographs that record our current dystopian existence. The National Museum of African American History and Culture has uh, presented materials online earlier than anticipated. Uh, another difference will be the even uh, greater recognition as 
of the National Museum of African American History and Culture is noticing, is recognizing. Museums belong to communities and inhabit neighborhoods. The COVID-19 pandemic is not the only pandemic we are living with. The murder of George Floyd on May 25th and the subsequent protest in support of the Black Lives Matter movement is bringing focus to the pandemic of racism that is part of our history and our present. The National Museum of African American History and Culture launched this website talking about race earlier than anticipated in order to give the public resources for talking to each other and with our children about race. Further, museums throughout the world have issued statements of solidarity and visitors to museum websites can link to these from museum homepages, such as this one from the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. Museums and other cultural institutions are going even further, and some have opened their lobbies to protesters. Beginning June 5th, the Brooklyn Museum opened its lobby every day from 2 to 6 p.m. for protesters to come in and to rest, get water and food, use the restrooms, and have a place to regroup while respecting social distancing guidelines. The galleries remained closed, but the museum as an institution was making a clear statement. In conclusion, whatever the new normal will be, museums will continue to stimulate our minds and get us to look beyond ourselves. If we have learned anything about museums from these past few months, I think it is that museums are not only the keepers of our cultural heritage, but have the potential to direct our better intentions for our futures. Thank you. And now my colleague, Dr. Susie Kim. Hello, everyone. My main theme of this talk is uh, art and meditation, Zen Buddhist art during the Muromachi period in Japan. The outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic has been stressful for lots of people around the world. Fear and anxiety about the virus can be overwhelming and cause strong emotions. Stress can include a fear and worry about your own health and families, changes in sleep or eating patterns, and worsening of chronic health problems or mental health conditions. Everyone reacts differently uh, to the stressful situations, and the CDC recommends to take care of yourself and your community. To cope with stress, taking breaks from watching, reading, or listening to news stories, taking care of your body, making time to unwind, and keep connected with others are recommended. In this short lecture, I would like to suggest coping with stress by contemplating Zen Buddhist art from Japan. Let me start with a brief introduction of the historical period when Zen Buddhism started to spread in Japan. During the Kamakura period, the foundation of the Japanese feudal system has been defined by the rise of the warrior class, which held martial skills and ideals of duty, loyalty, and bravery in the highest regards. The feudal system starts with having the emperor on top and the shogun, the hereditary military dictator, the daimyos, who were provincial military lords, the samurai, members of the warrior class, and then the farmers, artisans, and merchants. Chan in Japanese Zen, Buddhism from China, which emphasized discipline, concentration, and direct action became highly influential as it appealed to the sensibilities of the warriors, the samurais. The Muromachi period, which comes after the Kamakura period, was named after a district in Kyoto, Japan, where the headquarters of the Ashikaga shogunate was located. For nearly 200 years, the Ashikaga shogunate never succeeded in extending their political control due to the rise and rivalry of the daimyo. With the political turmoil and the collapse of the shogunate's power, the country was plunged into a century of warfare and social chaos. Despite the social and political upheaval, the Muromachi period was economically and artistically innovative with the establishment of modern commercial transportation and urban networks. One of the imports from China that had a far reaching impact was Zen Buddhism. Zen Buddhism, one of the many branches of Buddhism has been known in Japan since the seventh century. 
It was enthusiastically embraced by the military class beginning with the Kamakura period and went on to have a profound effect on all aspects of national life from government and commerce to the arts and education. Zen Buddhism's origins connect with one Bodhidharma, Daruma in Japanese, who arrived in China during the sixth century. Daruma was believed as being the Persian monk who arrived through the Silk Road in the Wei capital of Liuliang in China, or an Indian prince who sailed on a reed arriving in southern part of China. In Buddhism with its many branches, the goal of a Buddhist practitioner is to break the endless cycle of reincarnation and realize the true nature of things and finally achieve the true bliss, the nirvana. For Daruma, the key to enlightenment was intense meditation. Meditation is the name of the school he established, Tiana in Sanskrit, Chan in Chinese, Sun in Korean, and Zen in Japanese. In the image on the left, Japanese artist Sesho Toyo uh, depicts Daruma with bushy eyebrows, a beard, big nose, bulging eyes with no eyelid, no one earring, which is an appearance of a foreigner. Daruma is famous for having meditated in a cave facing its back wall. Arriving at the Shaolin Temple in Henan province of China, he tucked himself into a meditation posture, legs folded under his body. Fading into deep meditation for nine years, his legs atrophied and fell away from his body as well as his arms. He cut off his eyelids to meditate permanently and not to fall asleep. These legends spawned armless and legless round Daruma dolls, which spring back when pushed over. Mostly in red, these dolls are symbols of good luck. They are portable and tangible New Year's resolutions in Japan. If you have a major project like an entrance exam to college, you can paint in Daruma's left eye, symbolizing your commitment to task ahead. When the task is completed, you paint on this right eye, leaving you the finished doll in a feeling of immense satisfaction. In Zen Buddhism, deep awareness of truth, often framed as the truth of life and death, is the key. Promotion of the enlightenment in present lifetime can be achieved through intense meditation. This can be reached by a combination of two main practices, Zazen, meditation while sitting straight back with legs crossed, and second, the study of koan, which means questions and exchanges with a Zen Buddhist master that cannot be understood or answered by rational thought. Zen Buddhism became popular among the samurais who lived in an endangered life. The meditation practice eschewed the elaborate rituals and scriptures of other religious practices, and there was no concern for death. This suited the samurai's practice as they had to be ready to die at any moment. Now let's take about 30 minutes to contemplate this painting. Please focus on your emotional response rather than trying to decipher or interpret this painting. This is the landscape painting of the Four Seasons, Eight Views of the Shao and Shang Rivers by Soami, a Japanese artist. The painting refers to a landscape painting by Mu Qi, a 13th century Chinese monk painter. It is a pair of six panel folding screens and ink on paper. Vignettes of daily life are unified into a monumental ink landscape showing the progression of four seasons, beginning with the misty spring right here, and far right and ending with a wintry snow covered scene in the far left. The artist gave his brush and imagination free reign to create images that embodies the Zen Buddhist principles such as authority, self-discipline, respect for nature and the importance of meditation. The mountain peaks and the hills are placed in a harmonious way. Minimal color has been used and everything is reduced to a few accents. Leaving out details and providing more empty space, the void are typical features of Zen Buddhist paintings. The individual must take an effort to see a world in a different angle. As a viewer, you need to concentrate on how you feel if surrounded by peaceful mountain peaks and water. It is about self-cultivation, 
and uh, as well as self-meditation. Contemplating the painting eases your mind and distracts you from worries. The viewing experience becomes a meditation process. Zen ink paintings on the top and the Zen dry landscape gardens have much in common. The garden looks like a three-dimensional landscape of the painting above. The landscape garden was one of the most innovative concepts as an aid to meditation. Because the gardens were built next to the temples, they were constructed in a limited amount of space and design. With small pebbles, rocks, live paintings, uh, live, live plantings, limited to moss and shrimp, simple shrubbery, the gardens were named kare sansui, meaning dry landscapes, even though some gardens incorporate ponds. The objects placed in the garden invite metaphysical interpretation. It is the garden of Dai Sen In, Dai Tokuji in Kyoto. The monks will sit here for meditation and visitors are welcome. The impression is minimal and vibrant color is absent, which is different from French gardens or the gardens we're used to see in the West. It is meant to be an external contemplation and not for walking in or around. Viewers meditate by looking at the tranquil scene from remote viewpoints. In the background, carefully selected rocks suggest mountain and a flat slab in the middle ground a bridge, while underneath a dream, a stream of white gravel flows into broad river dotted with islands. Every morning, the monks will rake the pebble, so it gives a really beautiful effect of the sea or sometimes the water. This is the dry landscape garden located in the Ryoanji in Kyoto, Japan. The raid garden has these beautiful ripples around rocks, which could be mountains peaking above clouds or maybe islands in a sea. The still water the mind reflects true reality, but once a stone, like a thought, creates ripple, reality becomes distorted. Ultimately, the Zen garden cannot be intellectualized, but can only be experienced by the viewer in search of spiritual growth, and it is part of a meditation process. For people whose depression and anxiety has been only heightened by the pandemic, contemplating art and Zen gardens can be a source of clarity and peaceful, positive mind. I want to finish my talk by introducing the Zen garden on our campus, The Little Sun, which was completed in 2018. It's located directly off of University of Mary Washington campus walk on the way to the amphitheater between Trinkle and Mason Hall. Hope you can visit the garden after our beautiful campus opens up, opens up again. Thank you. Thank you very much, all three of you. That was terrific. Uh, Dr. Kim, Dr. Ock, Dr. Delancey, uh, that was wonderful. Uh, please go ahead and, and, and turn your video on and we're gonna get right into the Q&A. I'm Keith Mellinger, I'm the Dean for the College of Arts and Sciences and uh, I've been monitoring the Q&A throughout the presentations here. We got, got a lot of good questions and I'm gonna get started here by, I think I'm gonna direct the first one to uh, Dr. Delancey. Um, the, the question that there's, I'm going to combine a few questions actually, uh, there was one that came in was basically asking about the parallels between um, art of the time of the plague in, in Venice and art uh, now during, during COVID-19, but I think more broadly, um, how, how does this sort of uh, national tragedy, how does it affect art of the time? Yeah. Um... That's a, it's a really, really great question. And I think in, in many ways, it's difficult to answer right now simply because um, art's being made as we speak. Um, I think without question, there's gonna be direct effects. Um, and it'll be up to a lot of artists that we, you know, that we see um, uh, to figure out what that art's gonna look like. I don't think that probably there'll be any kind of unifying style. Um, or any kind of um, probably even unifying sense of medium, anything like that. Um, but it's going to be fascinating to see how how that um, how that plays out. You know, I think the difference in with what's going on now and what was being produced in Venice at the time is in Venice at the time there were much more um, sort of standard expectations about what art might look like. Um, and now I think there's a lot more flexibility in terms of every choice that an artist has. And I'd really encourage everyone to kind of keep an eye on um, lots and lots of different outlets, social media, but um, uh, also um, other ways of keeping, on, keeping up on what's going on in the art world to see what comes out of this moment. Excellent. Well, uh, thank you all for the, to the presenters. There's such a rich discussion about um, historic parallels, uh, the role that art plays in the way that we're managing difficult times like this. 
Um, and then also what the role for museums might be. And so I have the next question that I wanna first at least direct it toward Dr. Ock and then certainly open it up for anybody else. Uh, as you discussed, Dr. Ock, obviously that we're not at the point, I and mean, it probably won't be, will be quite a while before we can return to museums being a space with a number of people gathered around a piece of artwork. And sometimes that goes too far as some questions have mentioned, you know, the people pack like sardines trying to get a glimpse of the Mona Lisa almost become an exhibit in themselves. Um, and we're not gonna be able to get to that anytime soon. Um, now you mentioned some of the ways that museums have already adapted to try and share their collections with broader communities. I uh, wanted to give you a chance, maybe if, if speak to where you think museums might be able to go next. What other innovations you would expect to see museums provide to be able to share their art with broader communities? I think, um, excellent question. Thank you, Anand. Um, Dr. Rao, um, I think the museums will continue to have an online presence. I think that presence will continue to grow. Um, I think museums may also um, turn to um, perhaps bringing individual um, uh, uh, programs, say, to schools or uh, to nursing homes um, uh, where smaller groups of, of people could experience them and, and see um, works or, or to have a, a tour of the museum. Uh, for the time being, I think social distancing will continue. Uh, I think museums will have many few admissions, many few people um, participating uh, in, in everything. So. It will be a wonderful opportunity for the lucky few uh, to see the Mona Lisa as it hasn't been seen in decades, uh, but it's going to be uh, maybe a, a more rarefied experience. Thanks for that. I'd, I'd like to um, maybe push this next question to, to Dr. Kim. Uh, do you think artistic depictions of the pandemic will have any effect on how future generations see it? I think that's a really great question. So the way uh, the artists will view the pandemic at this moment will be recorded and they will be presented in the museums in the and for the future generation. So it's highly important uh, to have this connection to see like how the artists respond and how the museum is starting to collect the collections of the artist's work that are uh, talking more about the pandemic. I think it's a critical question at this moment. We are now living in the status quo and it's happening at this very moment. So keeping records, keeping uh, like, you know, uh, starting paintings related to this, uh, this, idea, uh, this uh, anxiety or any types of stress. And then that needs to be also also going back to the collection of the museum as like, you know, the bubonic uh, plague, which has been recorded and also through the paintings, I think it should happen in this moment as well. That's excellent. Um, you know, one of the aspects that Dr. Ock talked a bit about is the way that museums are already adapting to reflect current events. Uh, and I really appreciated that. And after yesterday's session, it was really interesting to see the role that museums are playing in that regard. Uh, we have a, a similar question talking about how museums can represent visually um, many of the events that are going on right now, not just with the pandemic, but also with other events such as protests. Uh, and, and so thinking about that, let me um, turn this to, to Dr. Delancey first, and then maybe if Dr. Kim would like to speak to it as well. Do you think that some of the street art that is coming out of re visual representations of current events will be used to represent this time period, perhaps the pandemic as a time period, or this decade? How do you think that that will, will play out in terms of how future generations will look back on it? Yeah, I think there again, that's a great question. And in, in many ways, both Dr. Ock and Dr. Kim have alluded to one of the biggest challenges for us as communities, especially with something like street art, is um, that that art can be pretty ephemeral. It can be stuff that's made um, uh, sometimes permanent, sometimes not permanent, often attached, say, to a building where the building then later gets destroyed. And, and so I think in many ways that art absolutely has a, a great deal of power to tell us about what's going on now. The challenge for us um, is going to be how we preserve it as a culture. And I think in many ways that's something that we're dealing with in a lot of ways um, uh, really globally right now is what art are we choosing to preserve? What art are we choosing not to preserve? Um, and so that's something I think we'll, we'll um, work on as a community, I hope. 
Dr. Kim, I, I wanted to give you a chance if you had anything you wanted to add to that. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I think a medium is an important factor. Sometimes a street art has been uh, already recognized as significant art uh, since the 1970s. Uh, you know, everyone knows Banksy, everyone knows a couple of artists who are doing street art. And uh, I think it's the very moment where we can create anything with any medium. Uh, there is no bar or hierarchy in high art anymore. So most of the arts that you can create at this moment, I know we all have limitations. We cannot have access to a variety of mediums at this moment. So maybe smaller arts or smaller scale arts can be all preserved in the museum. I think the idea, the standard of art can be also changing uh, during the pandemic and street art, which was already a big scene in contemporary art. I think it can be a bigger uh, moment uh, because of, you know, the street art that's happening now in DC. Uh, that should be all considered as art and the medium is changing at this very moment. So it's a significant change in contemporary art. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, We've talked a lot about um, museums and the the effect on um, the public being able to access, um, but I was wondering, Dr. Ock, if you could talk a little bit about the economic impact on curators and guides who work in these these locations, because clearly this is, must have, you know, taken its toll on them economically as well, right? Yeah. By, yes, indeed. Um, by some accounts, there could be um, uh, great losses uh, in, in the museum world in terms of uh, museums closing, um, perhaps 10% uh, of museums uh, closing um, worldwide. Uh, other museums may uh, significantly uh, suffer from um, lack of funding, which is definitely a real thing. Uh, the students in the course uh, read a, a short article on the globe uh, Shakespeare Theater and Museum uh, in the City of London. Well, the cultural institutions that are also performance-based, they are not performing. They, they cannot perform uh, right now, so they cannot uh, have the, the resources um, you know, to, to, uh, uh, to, to create the, the funding that is required. So individuals uh, there are um, really fearing for their futures uh, and the future of the institution itself. Um, and in terms of reopening museum staff, uh, museums are thinking very carefully about um, the, the welfare of the staff as well as the visitors. So, you know, having um, not only a, a, a mask, but a, a mask, a, a complete face mask uh, that will protect um, uh, guides as well as curators who will meet the public. Um, so that is uh, a, a concern of museums. So there are, the economics of this is serious and the health, um, health issues uh, for opening up are also very serious. Thank you for that. Yeah, there are obviously so many different competing interests and um, different impacts that we, we really should be considering. Um, you know, I'd like to, to go back to something just before that question that Dr. Kim was speaking to in terms of street art and other types of art being recognized. And it ties to another question that was in the queue, and that is whether or not you think that the public's view of art might change as a result of this pandemic. Um. I think there is a certain push. Uh, so the, the terms of viewing art, uh, you know, online exhibitions uh, was already introduced, um, maybe already from five, 10 years ago, there were online exhibition platforms and a museum, especially the Smithsonian was already preparing for online exhibitions. They were hiring curators who will uh, actually uh, provide online exhibitions rather than having actual exhibitions. So it was already happening. I think with the pandemic, it's pushed forwards. There are many other ways, like, you know, now we are having more online courses that we never ex expected before. You know, our whole campus was switched to online. So there were new ways introduced to go for future exhibitions. I think the same thing will happen with the museums as well. Uh, so before it was like physical visit was so important because of this interaction with the image, but there are many other ways to be introduced to a work of art without making the physical visit. And I think this pandemic is really pushing forward the type of, um, uh, yeah, idea. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Um, all right, I'd like to take us back to Venice and Dr. Delancey. Um, there is a, a question that refers to um, uh, one of the readings or uh, some of the readings that were um, in Canvas for the students. Um, 
And some of them included very specific durations, like being banned for 20 days uh, is, a, is a good example. Um, how did they come up with these numbers? Was there a, a precedent? Uh, did this require trial and error? Did it come from other cultures around the area? Can you just speak a little bit to those, those requirements that we, that we saw? Yeah, yeah, that's, again, that's a great question. And it sort of goes back to this, um, this idea of these two different ways that, that Venetians viewed the plague or two different causes. So there's a kind of physical scientific causes, but then the religious spiritual causes. And so some of it's trial and error, but some of it also is connecting with um, uh, beliefs about um, the power of particular numbers. And 40, um, any of you that have looked at the Judeo-Christian tradition, um, Old and New Testament, will be aware that the number 40 returns a lot. Um, and so, uh, for example, um, it's that 40 days of the flood, um, 40 days that Jesus is supposed to have been tempted in the wilderness. And so that's where the 40 days of quarantine comes from. And then some of the other periods, 20 days, for example, then are kind of subsections of that. Um, but then some of it, uh, as, as the person asking the question surmised, some of it's also trial and error. Some of it relates to um, those time periods being relevant for other things um, in the state also. So numbers that are used fairly regularly in the state also. That's great, thank you. Um, you know, we had another question that was near the top that I wanted to, to share and also offer to maybe take it to our colleagues in biology because it's a question about, I think is really prompted by the discussion today I'm not sure that any of us are the kinds of doctors that could really speak to it necessarily, though. Um, if we had the modern medicine that we have now during the time of the plague, um, would that have changed the course of the plague, perhaps? Um, and, you know, I welcome any answers that you all might have, but I offered in the chat that I, I'll take this to our colleagues in biology, and maybe we can bring an answer to that a, a little bit later, because that chart in particular, Dr. Delancey, that you noted, I remember seeing that on social media that shows just the huge uh, the number of cases affected by the plague. And you kind of wonder if they had modern medical practices, if it would have been 200 million deaths. Um, and similarly, if we didn't have modern medicine now, would COVID then drive to, to that level as well? Yeah, and, and I, <laughs> I think you're right. I, that one's a great one for the biologists. Um, the, the plague still exists. You can still get the bubonic plague. Um, it has not been eradicated. Um, it's largely kept under control, as I understand it, by antibiotics. And so I think, you know, without question, if we had the kind of medicine that we do now, then it would have been um, probably less significant. That's also sort of a, a um, historical problem as well. It's hard for us um, uh, to know it's hard to sometimes make those kinds of slides back and say if we if we had what we have now then would it have worked exactly the same way that can that can be sort of a problematic thing to get into um, but yeah i think that's something for the biologists to <laughs> to tackle as well because they'll be able to talk with us some uh, more about how the medications that we have work specifically sure. dr well, one contribution to that and, and uh, dr delancey you can speak to this further one interesting parallel between today and the early modern period of Venice that you're talking about is the global nature of, of now and then. And it's that, um, uh, uh, that, that global quality, that the movement of people uh, that really spread the bubonic plague and that is, uh, has, has spread COVID-19. COVID-19 spread much more quickly, but if people weren't moving, if there weren't uh, merchants uh, in the 14th century, then that may not have occurred as well as in the 17th century. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and by the way, we, best, we received a message in the chat from uh, Dr. Parrish Waters, one of the biologists who presented at the beginning of the course, and he just noted, see, Julie is just as good as any of us. So uh, it sounds like Dr. Delancey got that one right. Uh, I appreciate that. Okay, we're, we're um, running out of time here, but I want to put all three of you on the spot for one, one final question here. And it, it's very broad, and um, there's, there's lots of ways that you can approach this. But I, I want to ask all three of you to tell us how, in, in your opinion, how art can help us to heal. Let's start with Dr. Um, let's see here. How about Dr. Delancey first? Keith, do you mind repeating the question again? 
Yes. How can art help us to heal? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I think Sue, Dr. Kim has given us a wonderful example of that, um, of connections between um, uh, art helping with everything from stress reduction. Um, I can also say in the early modern period, art was seen as part of the work of hospitals. Hospitals had art in them, and that was seen as part of not just visual pleasure, but, but curing people. Um, but I'd love to hear what others have to say, too. I know we're short on time. Dr. Ock? Yeah, I, I would agree that it, is, it offers an opportunity to, to meditate, uh, to lower stress. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and um, it, it allows us perhaps to, to get out of ourselves and to experience uh, perspective. Uh, and that can be important in, um, in, in putting our own uh, it, it, suffering or our, our own experiences, you know, laying, them, laying them aside uh, and seeing the world through someone else's eyes. Yeah, I agree with uh, both of you. I think uh, art is a learning experience. Everyone wants to learn a little bit uh, and do interpretation. Uh, for Japanese art, it's more emptying your mind. They don't give you clues, so they're not uh, giving you any answers. You cannot find the answer in the painting or any types of art. You should probably just be more prepared to think about yourself when you look at it. So it's kind of like a therapeutic um, method that you are looking at art and not trying to figure out like what the artist's intention was, but more maybe be more figuring out like what your intention is by looking at art and think about more about yourself when you contemplate art. Wow. Well, thank you very much for that. that, that this was really terrific. Um, Dr. Julia Delancey, Dr. Marjorie Ock, Dr. Susie Kim, this was a, a wonderful experience today with the three of you. Thank you so much for your expertise. And I want to thank everybody for joining us again for COVID-19 in Context. Uh, just a little preview next week. We have our uh, department chair of the Department of English and Linguistics who will be speaking about literary uh, representations of cultural uncertainty during COVID-19. And then on Wednesday, we have three of our chemists uh, speaking about the chemistry of disinfectants and sanitizers. So it's going to be a good week next week. Lots of good stuff coming. Um, students, we'll see you in the small group discussions in a few minutes. Thank you all so much for joining us and thank you again to the three speakers today. It was really terrific.